Beauty and the Beast There was once a merchant who had three daughters, Bella, Beta and Beauty. Sometimes the merchant had to travel many miles to go to market and he could be gone for days at a time. One day, before riding to market, the merchant told his daughters he would bring back a present for each of them. The girls were very excited. Well, what would you like? said the merchant. I would like a pearl necklace, said Bella. I would like a new dress, said Beta. I just want you to come home safe and sound, said Beauty. Is that all? asked her father. Surely there must be something that you'd like. Beauty thought about it for a minute, then said, I would like a rose if you see one, a pink one if possible. The merchant said goodbye to his daughters and set off for the market. He bought a necklace for Bella and a bright red dress for Beta, but he couldn't find a rose for Beauty. On his way home that night, the merchant got lost. To make matters worse, a terrible storm soon started. The rain lashed and the thunder crashed and the lightning lit up the sky. It wasn't long before the merchant was soaked through freezing cold and starting to worry. He might never make it home if he didn't find shelter soon. Then he spotted a building perched on top of a hill. It was a grand castle, surrounded by beautiful gardens. All of the lights were on and smoke was rising from the chimney. Somebody must be home. The merchant hurried forwards and knocked on the door. It swung open slowly, but no one was there. Hello, shouted the merchant. Is anyone home? But nobody answered. The merchant shut the door behind him and ventured into the building. The main hall was wonderfully warm and inviting. A roaring fire burned in the grate and hundreds of candles lit up the room. But the most impressive thing was the table, which was piled high with piping hot food. There was enough food for a whole banquet. The merchant helped himself to a plate and tucked into a hearty supper. He was starving after his long day. Once he had eaten, the merchant was ready for bed. He thought no one would mind if he slept in one of the soft, warm beds upstairs. He could hardly go back out into the storm. He climbed into the first bed he found, put up his feet, and instantly fell asleep. In the morning, the merchant went downstairs. There was still no sign of anyone else in the castle, but the huge table of food had mysteriously disappeared. Instead, a small table had been laid for breakfast. The merchant feasted on toast and pastries and washed them down with fresh orange juice. He felt completely refreshed and ready to set off for home. As he was leaving the castle, the merchant remembered his promise to beauty. The castle garden was full of roses and he spotted a lovely pink rose right by the gate. As he picked the rose, he heard a terrible roar right behind him. A terrifying beast had appeared from nowhere. It had a snarling snout like a wolf, long claws like a bear, and a shaggy mane of hair like a lion. But it stood on two legs, just like a man, and dressed in splendid clothes like a prince might wear. Ungrateful man, the beast bellowed. I have treated you like family. You have eaten from my table and slept in my bed. You did not have to suffer in the storm. But this is how you repay me? By stealing my favourite rose? I will have to kill you for this. Please don't kill me, said the merchant. I didn't know this was your favourite rose. I was just picking it for my daughter as a gift. I didn't know that anyone lived here. I shouted out, but nobody answered. I have been so grateful for your food and shelter, but please don't kill me. I'll do anything, anything, if you spare my life. Hmm, said the beast. I will spare your life but only if you bring me something. You must bring back the first living thing you see when you reach home. The merchant sighed with relief. This would be an animal on the land, a cow or a horse, or maybe one of his dogs. He agreed to the beast's condition and set off for home. The merchant was nearly home when he heard a small voice crying. Father, father! It was Beauty, running down the lane to meet him. The merchant burst into tears he would have to take his daughter back to that terrifying creature. He explained everything to Beauty and she agreed to go. The next day, she packed her bags and went to the castle. At first, Beauty was afraid of the beast. He was so very big, with such scary teeth and claws. 
but he was always kind and polite. He made sure that Beauty had everything she needed. He remembered that Beauty's favourite flowers were roses, and every day he would pick her a beautiful posy from his garden. Beauty tried to avoid the beast, but she had to see him at meal times. He asked her all about her father and her family, but he said little about himself. Over the weeks they learned more about each other. Beauty began to enjoy their conversations. They started to go for walks together and to sit by the fire and talk into the evening. One evening, as they were watching the fire burn down, the beast asked Beauty to marry him. She didn't know what to say. Of course she liked him, but she didn't want to marry him. Who could marry such an ugly creature? Of course, I understand, said the beast. Why would a wonderful girl like you marry a horrible creature like me? After that, the beast stopped taking his meals with Beauty and stopped going for walks with her. In fact, they barely even saw each other anymore. Beauty became very lonely. I wish I could see my family, she said. The beast did not want her to leave the castle. He was afraid she might never come back. But he did give her a gift. It was a little mirror that let her watch her family. She could see her sisters playing and her father working. She watched with envy as her family sat at the dinner table, talking and laughing. Beauty spent hours just staring at the mirror. One day, the beast found Beauty crying over her mirror. What's wrong? he said. My father is very ill, she answered. I must go to him before it is too late. What if he dies and I'm not with him? The beast thought long and hard. He did not want Beauty to ever leave the castle, but it broke his heart to see her crying. Very well, he said. You may go home to your father, but only for a week. You must come back here in seven days' time. Beauty quickly packed her things and raced home to her father. The merchant couldn't believe it when he woke up with Beauty by his side. Nursed by his daughters, he soon recovered. Beauty was thrilled to be home with her family. She spent hours telling them about life at the castle and how kind the beast had been. She was so happy that she forgot all about her promise. Seven days passed, and then another seven. She had completely forgotten her promise to the beast. One morning, as she was dressing, Beauty glanced at her magic mirror. There, in the reflection, she saw the beast in his rose garden, crying as though his heart had broken. I have done this, said Beauty. My poor beast. I have abandoned him, and it has broken his heart. And as she said it, she realised that she did love the beast, and she did want to marry him. Beauty raced out of the house and ran all the way to the castle. Beast! Beast! she cried. She pushed open the castle doors and ran round all the rooms in the house. Finally, she found the beast in the castle gardens. Please don't cry, she said. I love you, I love you, and of course I'll marry you. The beast stopped crying and started to smile. At that moment, something magical happened. The hair on his face and neck started to disappear. His long snout grew shorter and shorter and turned into a handsome nose. His fierce claws turned into long, slim fingers. He was not an ugly beast any more. He was a very handsome prince. Oh, beauty, he said. I have been wanting to tell you for so long, but the spell wouldn't let me. One night, when I was a child, there was a terrible storm. A stranger came to our door to ask for shelter, but my father turned her away. That stranger was a powerful witch. She wanted revenge after that. She killed my father and turned me into this monster. I would only be freed from her spell when I found someone to love me in that form. Your love has freed me from her spell. Thank you. Beauty and her prince were married the next month. Beauty's family were all invited, and the castle was decorated all over with lovely pink roses. Beauty and the prince were very happy together, and they always welcomed strangers into their home, especially on dark, stormy nights. The End
Cinderella Cinderella was a happy little girl because she lived in a very happy home. Her mother and father were the most wonderful people. They were fun and exciting to be around and they both loved their daughter very much. Cinderella's father was a strong, tall man with a booming laugh and a great sense of adventure. He often took his daughter on adventures, exploring the forest, swimming in the lake or into the hills to fly a kite. On the walk home from their adventures, he would always pick a bunch of flowers, carefully choosing the prettiest ones from the fields around their home. These flowers are for your mother, the most beautiful woman in all the land. One day, you will be just as beautiful as her. And indeed, Cinderella's mother was very beautiful. She had thick brown hair and a beaming smile. When she smiled, Cinderella knew that she was safe and loved and no harm would ever come to her. Cinderella and her parents were very happy together, for a while. But then something terrible happened. When Cinderella was 13 years old, her mother suddenly died and her father married again. It wasn't long before he died too. Cinderella was left alone with her stepmother and her two ugly stepsisters. They hated Cinderella. They pinched her and teased her and called her nasty names. It's such a shame that there's no maid in this house, said the stepmother. Cinderella just sits around moping all day. It's so lazy of her. I think she should do some chores around the house. She can start by cleaning the fireplace. So Cinderella became a servant. She had to work hard all day, scrubbing the floors, cleaning the dishes, making the beds and darning the socks. The only time she could ever stop was in the evenings. While Cinderella was working, her stepsisters never did a thing. They were awfully spoiled. Their mother gave them expensive presents and took them on trips to the theatre and to dances, always hoping for a glimpse of the handsome Prince Charming. They wore all the latest fashions, while Cinderella was forced to wear filthy old rags. One day, a messenger arrived at the door. It was Cinderella's job to answer the door, so she quickly showed the man in. He announced that there was going to be a ball at the royal palace. It would be the event of the year, and the biggest news, Prince Charming would be there, and he wanted to find a wife. The family could hardly believe it. The stepmother and her daughters all screamed with excitement. A ball, a ball, they cried. What will we wear? Oh, Cinderella, fetch my blue dress. Cinderella, where is my pink purse? Cinderella, where are my diamond earrings? Cinderella was kept busy all week. She had to sew new dresses for her sisters and spend hours curling their hair. Every night she went back to the kitchen and cried because she wanted to go to the ball, but there was no way her stepmother would let her. On the night of the ball, Cinderella helped her sisters into their gowns, curled their hair and pinned it up neatly. When all was ready, she helped them into the coach and waved goodbye. The minute they had turned out of the drive, she burst into tears. Oh, it's not fair, she cried. They get to go to the ball and I have to stay here on my own and clean the house. It's just not fair. Suddenly, with a loud pop, a fairy appeared right there in the garden. Don't cry, Cinderella, she said. I am your fairy godmother and you shall go to the ball. But I can't go looking like this, said Cinderella looking at her dirty dress and bare feet. They wouldn't even let me in. The fairy smiled and waved her wand. Pop! The dirty dress turned into a beautiful pale pink gown. Pop! Two beautiful glass slippers appeared on Cinderella's little feet. Now, let me think, let me think, the fairy said. You will need a coach. Every lady arrives in a coach. But what can we use for that? Aha! She pointed her wand at the garden and... Pop! A coach popped up out of the pumpkin patch. Then she spotted six mice by the hedge. Pop, 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 pop! They were turned into four big horses and two handsome coachmen. Your carriage awaits, said the fairy, and she helped Cinderella into the coach. But remember, this magic will only last until midnight. You must be back home by then. When Cinderella arrived at the ball, everyone stopped and stared. Her father had been right. Cinderella was every bit as beautiful as her mother had been. 
She too had thick brown hair, light grey eyes and a wonderful smile. The whole room watched as the prince stepped forwards and asked Cinderella to dance. But nobody knew who this lovely girl was. Not even her stepsisters recognised her. Cinderella danced with Prince Charming all night. They were so happy, spinning and twirling around the room, that Cinderella completely forgot about the time. Suddenly, the big clock in the corner started to chime. Bong! It was the first stroke of midnight. Without a word, Cinderella turned from the prince and dashed away. She ran down the palace steps and jumped into her coach. Quick, she cried, we must reach home before the clock strikes twelve. The coachman took the reins and the horses sped forwards. They were gone in a cloud of dust before the prince could reach them. But there, on the steps of the palace, he found one elegant glass slipper. It had fallen off Cinderella's foot as she fled. Cinderella got home just in time. As the clock struck twelve, the magic suddenly ended. Her coach turned back into a pumpkin, the horses turned back into mice, and the ball gown turned into rags. Soon after, the stepmother and stepsisters came home, full of talk about the ball. They still had no idea at all that Cinderella had been there. Prince Charming had fallen terribly in love with Cinderella. We have to find her, he said. If I can't find her, I'll never be happy again. The girl whose foot fits in this slipper will be the girl I marry. The prince and his men knocked on every door in the kingdom. Soon, nearly every girl in the kingdom had tried on Cinderella's slipper, but it didn't fit any of them. One day, the prince arrived at Cinderella's house. The stepmother welcomed him in, smiling and curtsying. Excuse me, he said. How many young ladies live in this house? Just two said the stepmother. Look, here they are, my beautiful daughters. The stepsisters blushed and giggled. They each tried the slipper, but their feet were just too big. Try harder, whispered their mother. If you put on this shoe, you'll be a princess. How hard can it be? The girls pushed and pulled and tugged at the slipper, but it was no use. It was just too small. At that moment, Cinderella came in from the garden. She had been picking vegetables and her hands were covered in dirt, but the prince still smiled at her kindly. Why, there is another young lady in this house, he said. She must try the slipper too. What? Cinderella? said the stepmother. She's not who you're looking for. Look at her, she's filthy. She wasn't even at the ball. But the prince insisted that Cinderella try on the slipper. To everyone's astonishment, it was a perfect fit. It is you, said the prince. He took Cinderella back to the castle. There she was given every luxury that a princess deserved. And that was where she married the prince and lived happily ever after. The end. Rapunzel There was once a married couple who lived next door to a witch. They didn't see her often, but they knew she was a witch because she looked just like one. She had a warty nose, a pointed chin, and she always wore a big black hat. Her house looked just like a witch's house too, with little sooty windows, a pointy black roof, and a wobbly chimney pot that was always spouting strangely coloured smoke. Her garden, on the other hand, was very beautiful and unwitchy. It had a rose bed and a water feature and a smart little vegetable patch. In spring, the married couple discovered that they were going to have a baby. As the months went by, the pregnant wife started to ask for all sorts of strange foods. One day she wanted crab to eat. The next day she wanted a pickled egg. And another day she wanted radishes. But not just any old radishes. 
She wanted the radishes that grew in the witch's garden. We can't ask for those, said her husband. You know what the nasty old witch is like. But I have to eat those radishes, said the wife. They're the only thing that will make me feel better. The husband was persuaded to climb over the wall and steal the radishes. He waited until it was dark, then made his way into the garden. He was just bending down to pick the radishes when a light came on, and there was the witch. Thief! she cried. How dare you break into my garden and raid my vegetable patch! I'll put a curse on you! Oh, please don't, cried the man. I was just taking your radishes for my wife, who is pregnant. She says they're the only thing that will make her feel well. We will give you something in exchange. We have apples growing in our garden. Take some of those. I don't want your apples, said the witch. But there is one thing you can give me. In exchange for these radishes, you must give me the baby when it is born. And if you don't do that, I will curse your whole family. The poor man was horror struck, but he had no choice. He was so afraid of the witch that he agreed to everything she said. When the baby was born, she was a beautiful little girl with golden hair and bright blue eyes. As agreed, the witch came to take the baby away. She named her Rapunzel and locked her up in a tall tower in the forest. The tower had no doors or stairs and there was just one window at the very top. As Rapunzel grew older, her golden hair grew longer and longer. By the time she was six years old, it reached right down to her feet. By the time she was 16, it reached all the way from the highest window to the bottom of the tower. The only person Rapunzel ever saw was the witch, who visited every day to bring food and drink. Every day the witch would arrive and shout out, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your fair hair! Rapunzel would drop her long plaited hair out of the window and the witch would use it as a rope to climb up the side of the wall. When the witch was not there, Rapunzel spent the day reading, drawing and singing to herself. One day, a handsome prince was riding through the forest when he heard a beautiful song. He followed the music until at last he came to the high tower. There, at the top, was the most beautiful girl he had ever seen. She was sitting in the window and singing as she plaited her hair. The prince was about to call out to her when a strange old woman came hobbling up. The woman stopped at the base of the tower and shouted, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your fair hair! Rapunzel threw down her hair and the strange old woman climbed up and in through the window. The next day, the prince rode back to the tower. He copied the witch and shouted, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your fair hair! Rapunzel didn't even look out the window. She just threw down her hair. She was quite surprised when a handsome prince came climbing into the tower. Oh! cried Rapunzel. Who are you? I was only expecting that nasty old witch. The prince explained how he had heard Rapunzel singing and seen her in the tower and had fallen completely in love with her. Rapunzel soon felt the same way about the prince. He returned to the tower every day, always being careful to avoid the witch. Before long, Rapunzel made a terrible mistake. As the witch was climbing up her hair, Rapunzel said, Ouch! You are so heavy when you climb, the prince is much more gentle. The witch was furious. Prince! she shouted. How dare you bring other people into this tower! You have been deceiving me! You and your prince will be punished for this! The witch took out her scissors and cut off all of Rapunzel's lovely hair. Then she sent Rapunzel far away, out beyond the forest. Rapunzel had to live on her own, not knowing if or when she would ever see her prince again. When the prince next came to the tower, the witch played a nasty trick on him. Rapunzel, Rapunzel, shouted the prince. The witch dropped down Rapunzel's long gold braid out of the window and the prince climbed up to the top. He was expecting to see his beautiful Rapunzel, but instead he came face to face with the ugly old witch. Aha! said the witch. I tricked you! And with that, she pushed the prince out of the tower. He fell down, down, down and landed, thump, right in the middle of a thorn bush. He was bruised and sore and his eyes were badly hurt. He couldn't see anything for a long time, but he desperately hoped to find Rapunzel again. One day, the prince heard a beautiful voice singing. 
At first he thought he was imagining it. It sounded just like Rapunzel, but he hadn't seen or heard of her for years. The prince stumbled slowly towards the sound. And would you believe it? It was Rapunzel! When she saw the prince, she cried for joy and ran towards him. Her tears fell on his eyes, and at once he could see again. The prince took Rapunzel back to his kingdom, where they lived together for many happy years, and never saw that nasty old witch ever again. The End Sleeping Beauty Long, long ago lived a king and queen who didn't have any children. One day, the queen was swimming in the river when a frog hopped onto the lily pad next to her. It was a small green frog, much like any other, but the queen knew at once that this frog was magical. I know what you wish for, croaked the frog. You wish for a child. Fear not, queen. Your wish shall be fulfilled. In the next year, you will have a little girl, and you will call her Lily. The queen was quite astonished. A magical talking frog and a wish come true. But before she could even say thank you, the frog hopped off with a splash and disappeared. Sure enough, the queen had a little girl. She was a beautiful child with soft blonde hair and big blue eyes, the colour of the river. The king and queen named her princess Lily, just like the frog had told them to. The king was so excited at the birth of his daughter that he decided to throw a huge party. He ordered enough food and drink for hundreds of people. There were huge roasts of meat, piping hot potatoes, exotic fruits and enormous cakes. The king invited friends, family and neighbours. He invited princes and lords and knights from all over the country. He invited five good fairies so that they could give the princess their blessings. In fact, the only person the king didn't invite was the one wicked fairy. Everybody knew that she was mean and spiteful. The king didn't want anyone like that around his precious daughter. The five good fairies arrived on soft, fluttering wings. When the feasting was over, they lined up to give their blessings. The first fairy gave the gift of health. The second fairy gave the gift of joy. The third fairy blessed the princess with wisdom. The fourth fairy gave friendship. The fifth fairy was about to speak when... Bang! A huge puff of pink smoke went off beside the royal crib. The smoke cleared, revealing a dark, stooped figure. It was the only uninvited guest, the wicked fairy. Why was I not invited to this party? said the fairy in a loud, booming voice. Oh, uh, what? squeaked the king. Uh, your invitation must have got lost in the post. Don't think you can fool me, old man, said the fairy. I know that you don't want me here. It is a great insult not to be invited, but I shall get my revenge. The other fairies will have blessed the beautiful Ickle Princess. But I shall put a curse on her. When she is 18 years old, the princess will prick her finger and fall down dead. <laughs> the fairy threw back her head and laughed with glee. Then she clapped her hands, clap, and disappeared in another cloud of smoke. Everyone at the party was devastated. The king collapsed into his throne. The queen gathered her daughter in her arms and wept. All around the room, people were sobbing and wailing. But then the fifth fairy stepped forwards. Ahem, she said. I have not given my blessing yet. The king and queen looked up. Maybe there was some hope after all. The wicked fairy has strong magic and I cannot undo her curse. Everyone knows that a fairy's curse is impossible to break or undo. But my magic is strong too. 
and I can help. With my blessing, I can save the princess. She will not die when she pricks her finger. Instead, she will fall into a deep sleep that will last for a hundred years. The fairy stepped up to the baby's cot and wove her magic blessing. The king and queen thanked her and the party broke up. Over the years, the king and queen watched as the fairy's blessings came true. Princess Lily grew up to be strong, happy, clever and, above all, a great friend. Everyone in the kingdom loved her. As her 18th birthday drew near, the king and queen became desperate to protect their daughter from the wicked fairy's curse. They had to stop the princess from pricking her finger. The king ordered every needle in the kingdom to be destroyed. But even this was not enough. On the morning of her 18th birthday, the princess woke up bright and early. Nobody else was awake yet, so she decided to take a walk in the palace gardens. The roses were beautiful at this time of year and always smelt sweetest in the mornings. As the princess was walking, a pretty little bird swooped overhead. It had gold wings, a silver tail, and a bright red head, like a jewel. Hello, bird, said the princess. It is my birthday today. The bird tweeted back at her, then swooped down onto her shoulder. In its beak, it clasped a beautiful blood-red rose. It was just the same colour as the bird's pretty head. Is this for me? said the princess. Well, that's my birthday present of the day. What a thoughtful little bird you are. She reached out to take the rose, but as her fingers wrapped around the stem, a long, sharp thorn pierced her skin. Ouch, cried the princess. That hurt. She looked down at her finger to see a single spot of blood well up, and then she remembered the curse. The bird let out a piercing shriek sprung from Lily's shoulder and disappeared in a puff of pink smoke. It had not been the bird at all, but the wicked fairy in disguise. The princess walked back to her room in a daze. She climbed into bed, lay down her head, and at once fell into a deep, deep sleep. All over the castle, people fell asleep where they were. The king fell asleep on his throne. The queen nodded off in the bath. The cook started snoring as he stirred a pot. The horses nodded off in the stables, and the doves fell asleep on the roof. Years and years went by. The hedges around the castle grew tall and wild without any gardeners to tend to them. The stone walls crumbled, and grass sprung up between the tiles of the courtyard. Beyond the castle walls, stories were told about a beautiful princess in an enchanted sleep. Not many people believed the stories. They had forgotten all about the wicked fairy and her curse. But one young man believed the stories. He was a handsome prince, with dark hair and eyes as green as a frog. One day, he announced to his friends, I will set out to find the princess. I will save her from the curse. His friends all laughed at him. Those stories are nonsense, they said. There is no princess in that old castle. But the prince was determined. He saddled up his horse and set out at once. His friends reluctantly followed. They didn't believe in magic or fairies or curses, but didn't want to miss out on an adventure. When the prince reached the castle walls, he found his way was barred. Huge thorny roses covered the castle walls and hid the entrance from view. The prince and his friends drew their swords and hacked away at the plants. Eventually, they reached the gate and stumbled into the courtyard. It was just like the story said it would be. Every single person in the castle was fast asleep. The prince's friends were afraid. There is a strange magic here. Let's leave, they pleaded. Not now, said the prince. If the stories are true, then I have to find the princess and save her. We must head for the tallest tower. That is where she will be. The prince carefully stepped over the sleeping guard dogs. He passed the throne where the king was softly snoring. He passed servants asleep on the stairs where they stood. He climbed up the spiral stairs that led to the top of the tallest tower, and there he found the princess. She was peacefully sleeping, and was every bit as beautiful as the stories had said. Her golden hair was curled around her shoulders. She had soft, rosy cheeks and blood-red lips. The prince knew at once that he was in love. He could never leave the princess there. He leaned forwards and gave the princess a soft kiss. Her eyes fluttered open and fixed on his. 
At that moment, the rest of the palace sprung to life. No one had any idea that they'd been asleep for a hundred years. The king and queen were overjoyed that their daughter was alive and that she had fallen in love. A royal wedding was held at the palace and the king threw a huge feast in celebration. Everyone was invited. Royals and servants and fairies all came to the party. And what became of the wicked fairy? Well, she got stuck as a little red bird, which made it hard to be frightening and wicked. In time, she learned to be kind and generous, so the other fairies forgave her and turned her back into a fairy, and everyone lived happily ever after. The End Princess and the Pea Long ago, there was a very bossy queen. She was used to getting her own way, always. The queen had one child, a handsome prince. She made sure he had the best in everything. He only wore the finest clothes. He only ate the most delicious food. He had the very best school teachers, and his manners were the best in the kingdom. When it was time for the prince to marry, the queen was anxious that he would find himself a good match. Listen, son, she said. Every girl in the kingdom will want to marry you, but you must only settle for the best. It is important that you marry a real princess. Not every girl that claims to be a princess really comes from royalty. But how can I spot a real princess? asked the prince. Well, said the queen, she will only wear the finest clothes. Her hair will be beautifully arranged. She eats only the most delicate food, she has the finest education, she has the voice of an angel, and she only has the very best manners. So the prince travelled around the kingdom in search of a princess to marry, but he only met with disappointment. There were lots of princesses, but there was always something wrong with them. There were girls with pretty faces and lovely clothes, but terrible manners. There were girls with excellent manners and beautiful hair, but with harsh, screeching voices. And the worst thing was that the prince just didn't like any of them. The prince returned home, alone and disappointed. The king and queen were sad to see him like that, but were glad that he would only marry a real princess. One evening, there was a terrible storm. Lightning flashed outside the castle windows and thunder boomed in the dark night sky. Suddenly, someone knocked on the castle door. The prince opened the door and there stood the most beautiful girl. Her fine clothes were soaking wet and water dripped from the end of her long hair. Her delicate slippers were caked with mud. I was out with my driver when the storm struck, she said. Now we are lost and the horses are scared of the storm. Can we rest here for the night? The prince was shocked. This girl had the voice of an angel. Maybe she was a real princess. Of course, said the prince. You must take shelter here. The girl was invited in and introduced herself as a local princess. The prince was amazed, and the king was delighted. Only the bossy queen was suspicious. I do not believe this girl, said the queen. So many girls pretend to be princesses, but there is only one way of finding out if she is really a princess. The queen ordered twenty mattresses to be delivered from all over the castle, then sent for twenty soft feather duvets. The bedding was piled up high on top of a single uncooked pea. Now we shall see, said the queen. Only a real princess will fill the pea under all of that bedding. The princess was astonished when she saw her bedroom, but she scrambled up on a rickety ladder onto the top of the bed. She wondered why there were so many mattresses, but it would not be polite to ask. The next morning, the princess looked awful. She had dark bags under her eyes and could not stop yawning. I am so tired, said the princess. I didn't sleep a wink. It was the most uncomfortable bed 
I have ever slept in. I feel like I was lying on a brick all night. My body is bruised, black and blue all over. The queen beamed with joy. Only a real princess could have felt one tiny pea through all of those mattresses, the queen explained. You must be married at once. In no time at all, the prince and princess were married. They lived happily ever after, and as for the pea, it was placed in the Royal Museum, and you can still see it there today. The end. and the seven dwarves. There was once a very beautiful queen who had a little daughter. The daughter had hair as black as a raven, lips as red as blood, and skin as white as snow. And so she was called Snow White. Snow White was dearly loved by her mother and father, but when she was just a few years old, her mother died and her father married again. His new queen was beautiful too, but she was also vain and mean. She had a magic mirror that hung on the wall of her room. Every morning, she went up to the mirror and said, Miller, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? And every morning, the mirror replied, You, O oh queen, are the fairest of them all. The mirror always told the truth, so this answer made the queen very happy. Snow White became more and more beautiful with every passing year. Finally. There came a day when the queen looked in the mirror and said, Miller, Miller, on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? And the mirror replied, You, O oh queen, are fair, it's true, but young Snow White is fairer than you. The queen was furious. She stamped her feet and shouted. She asked the mirror again and again, but it always gave the same answer. The queen couldn't stand being second best, so she decided Snow White would have to be killed. She called her servant and ordered him to take the girl into the forest and kill her. You must bring me back her heart, she said. I will need proof that the girl is dead. The servant led Snow White deep into the forest. She had no idea where they were going. When the servant pulled out his knife and pointed the blade at Snow White, she fell to her feet and begged for her life. Now, the servant didn't want to kill Snow White, but he was afraid of the queen. You must stay in the forest, he told Snow White. If you ever come back to the palace, the queen will have you killed. Snow White agreed and the servant went back. Along the way, he killed a deer and cut out its heart to give to the queen. Snow White wandered through the forest, scared and alone. At last, she found a little cottage. When nobody answered the door, she pushed it open and stepped inside. There, she found a tiny room and a table set for seven people. There were seven little bowls, seven little cups, and seven little chairs. Snow White was very hungry. She helped herself to a little food, then went upstairs. There she found seven neatly made beds. Completely exhausted, she collapsed into the nearest bed and instantly fell asleep. The cottage was home to seven dwarves, who worked deep in a diamond mine all day. When they got home that evening, the dwarves had quite a shock. Somebody's been inside the cottage, they exclaimed. They've eaten our food. The dwarves crept upstairs and were amazed to find a beautiful girl asleep in one of their beds. She looked so peaceful that they decided not to wake her. The next morning, Snow White came downstairs to find the dwarves all eating their breakfast and they had laid an extra place for her. Good morning, said the dwarves. You are a welcome guest in our little cottage. Snow White thanked the dwarves and explained that her stepmother, the queen, had banished her. The dwarves said she was safe with them and asked her to stay for as long as she liked. Back at the palace, the queen was very happy that Snow White was dead. 
She stood in front of her magic mirror and said, Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? The mirror replied, You, O oh queen, are fair, it's true, but Snow White is still fairer than you. She lives with the seven dwarves out in the woods. The queen was furious. She realised she'd been tricked, so she decided to kill Snow White herself. She took a juicy red apple and filled it with poison. Then she disguised herself as a poor old woman and went in search of her stepdaughter. Snow White was working in the cottage garden when a noise made her look up. A stooped old woman was standing at the garden gate. Can I help you? said Snow White. Oh, don't worry about me, said the woman in a small, feeble voice. I'm just old and tired. I'll be fine once I've had a rest. Then you must come and sit inside, said Snow White. I'll fetch you a drink and something to eat, then you'll soon feel better. The old woman followed Snow White into the house and sat herself down by the fire. She gladly drank a glass of water and ate a big slice of bread. You have been so kind, said the old woman. I must give you something in return. She felt in her pockets and pulled out a rosy red apple. Take this, she said. It comes from my own garden. It is the sweetest apple you will ever taste. Snow White thanked the woman and bit into the apple. But the minute the fruit touched her lips, she fell to the floor and lay there as pale as death. The queen laughed wickedly. <laughs> Goodbye, my dear, she said. Now I alone am the fairest of them all. When the dwarves came home that evening, they found Snow White on the floor. She was so cold and pale that they were sure she must be dead. They cried all night long. Then they carefully laid her in a glass coffin and carried it up into the mountains. As they were walking, they met a handsome prince. Who is this girl you are carrying? said the prince. I've never seen anyone so beautiful in all my life. It is Snow White, said the dwarves. She was the king's daughter, banished by the wicked queen. But now she is dead and she'll never come back. The prince bowed his head at this sad news. I will help you to carry her coffin, he said. But as they were heading up the mountain, one of the dwarves stumbled. The coffin slipped and fell to the floor with a thud. As the coffin landed, the piece of poisoned apple fell out of Snow White's lips. She yawned and stretched and sat up wide awake. You're alive, cried the dwarves. They danced and sang and clapped with joy. Snow White and the prince joined in with the dancing. They danced hand in hand right into the night. Back at the palace, the queen stood in front of her mirror and said, Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? The mirror replied, You, O oh queen, are fair, it's true, but Snow White is far more fair than you. A handsome prince has saved the day. Now you, O oh queen, must go away. The queen couldn't believe it. She knew it was only a matter of time before the king discovered what she had done, so she packed her things as quickly as possible and ran far, far away. As for Snow White... She fell in love with the prince, of course, and lived happily ever after. The end.